Now this is my classic method for roasting a turkey. The key to its success is soaking cheesecloth in butter and wine and draping it over the turkey's breast while the turkey roasts. It results in an exceptionally moist and flavorful and beautifully bronzed bird. So let's start with the stuffing. Four onions peeled, medium chopped. Sauteed in one and a half sticks of butter. Have 16 ribs of celery chopped medium that can cook along with the onions. So these are starting to cook. Two loaves of country bread cut up into one inch cubes. And this can be day old. It's a little bit dry. And you can moisten the bread with about six and a half cups of stock. This can be turkey stock, vegetable stock. And I'm just moistening the bread, getting it, getting it to plump up a little bit. Dried bread really plumps up very nicely. Now there's quite a bit of salt and pepper, two teaspoons of coarse salt and four teaspoons or to taste. You might find that that's a little too much. Mm, it smells really good. 10 sage leaves, finely chopped. Two cups of pecans, finely chopped. And two cups of dried cherries. These are really good in the stuffing. But you could substitute prunes, cranberries, dried cranberries. Uh, you could substitute apricots. And to get these even a little softer, add a half a cup of turkey, chicken, or vegetable stock to your vegetables. Mm, does that smell good? And oh, three cups of chopped parsley. Makes a fragrant, herb-infused, tasty stuffing. And now, add your beautifully sauteed vegetables. Mm. What a nice addition. Now this stuffing should cool completely before you put it inside the turkey. And now to roast, three sticks of butter. This is for the basting liquid and for the cheesecloth covering. And one whole bottle of a white wine, like a Sauvignon Blanc or Chardonnay, works very well. Now immerse a piece of cheesecloth into that mixture. You're making a nice buttery, whiny cover for your bird. Use cotton cheesecloth. Turn that off and now to stuff. Stuff the neck cavity as well as the body cavity. For a large party, you're gonna need a big bird, 15 to 20 pounds. Figure one and a half pounds per person. Don't push it in too tightly because it really does expand when it cooks. This is a colorful and tasty and fragrant stuffing. Very, very nice stuffing. So pull that skin and affix with toothpicks. It's sort of like being in the operating room. And now your wing tips can be bent under. They're a little slippery and they fight you. Rinse your hands. You can trust now Use cotton string. So I go here, over the wings, over the drumsticks, and around. It's so nice because a bird cooks more evenly and the legs won't dry out. They're kept close to the body like this. And I always end by tying in a bow, then I can release it nicely. So there, transfer to your baking pan. Has to have a rack in it. Very important. And this will also hold the bird in shape. Fill in the rest of the cavity with stuffing. And all this beautiful excess stuffing, bake it in a baking dish. If you've used vegetable stock, it is perfect for the vegetarians in your family. So now, brush the bird all over with a little bit of room temperature butter. And the legs and the wings. And now season with sprinkling of salt and pepper all over the skin. Now the draping. Actually squeeze out a lot of the moisture from the cheesecloth. And I put it in there in quarters and I think it will still be in quarters. And now just drape this 
carefully over your entire bird. This goes into the 450 degree oven for 30 minutes. So now to baste, after you've reduced the oven temperature to 350 degrees, you can do this with a bowl baster or you can use a big ladle. Make sure you get the cheesecloth really, really wet. You can also take a lot of the juices from in the pan and baste with those. Two hours, 30 minutes. Every half hour, baste that cheesecloth. So now comes the time to take the cheesecloth off the bird and then brown it so it gets that beautiful mahogany glaze. Ah, lovely. You can just discard this. I have a bowl right here. And this goes right back into your 350 degree oven and you continue to baste every 15 minutes or so until the skin is just the color you want it and the interior temperature is 165 degrees. And you'll be very surprised at the color of the skin when it's finally done. This is a beautiful show-stopping centerpiece. I am garnishing with sage, all different kinds of sage, really pretty. Add some lady apples if you like, or because there's some pecans in the stuffing, I might sprinkle some shelled pecans in amidst the sage leaves, how pretty they look. So that's all done. Make sure you have somebody waiting with a very sharp knife to carve this beautiful bird. There are those naysayers who claim they don't like turkey because it's always dry. Well, that's definitely not the case if you roast your bird wrapped in parchment paper. To create a cozy steam packet is very, very easy. Once nearly cooked, you rip open and crank up the heat to brown the skin until it's crackling and crisp. Start with a 14 pound turkey. This is a good size for the average family. And I've decided to stuff this particular turkey with a sausage pear stuffing. About six cups fit in the cavity. And don't pack it in too tightly because it will expand while it's cooking. And you can turn your turkey over and secure the neck skin with a couple large toothpicks or skewers. This helps keep the skin in place and the stuffing in the cavity there. And now a lot of these turkeys have the wings clipped so that you can tuck them under the breast. Now push them under like that and then you can truss. Take a piece of twine and I go underneath here up over the drumsticks like this and just tie the legs together. You want to keep everything kind of compact so that everything roasts evenly and nicely. So there, that's very good. Take some softened butter. I'm using six tablespoons for the breast and really brush the skin generously with the butter. Do the whole breast and the wings and slather it on. Place your bird on the middle of a 40 inch piece of parchment paper that's 16 inches wide. And you're not finished with the butter. Two more tablespoons, so basically you're using one whole stick of butter and just do this middle part so that the underside does not stick to the parchment. There. Lift carefully and hope it doesn't slither out of your hands and plunk it down right here. And now fold the first piece. There are three pieces of parchment paper. Roll it down. We want to encase the turkey in the parchment. So this one now will be folded and rolled. This one is 48 inches long. It goes from front to back. Okay, so now your last piece, which is again 40 inches, and I will just turn this to make it easier. Have your oven preheated to 325 degrees, and the turkey's gonna go in for two hours and 45 minutes. So get this into the rack and now into the 325 degree oven, two hours, 45 minutes. 
So now this has been in the oven. Time to open it up. Now that is not a beautiful turkey, but it can be beautiful if you put it now into the oven uncovered for another 45 minutes to get brown. And before you put it back into the oven, add about a half a cup of water to the pan. 425 degrees for 45 minutes. No basting, nothing. The thermometer should read, when inserted into the thickest part of the flesh, 165 degrees for turkey. Perfectly roasted, moist, parchment-wrapped turkey. It's a very good turkey recipe, and you should try it. For those of you who love dark meat and don't want to cook a whole turkey, have you ever thought of just cooking the legs? My favorite method is to braise them in a rich herb-infused stock. Not only do they come out incredibly flavorful, they are also fall off the bone tender. The biggest difference between braising and stewing is that the meat is cut into smaller pieces for stews and entirely submerged in cooking liquid. Braised meats are cooked in larger pieces and only partially submerged turns out very flavorful this way. So notice I'm salt and peppering these turkey legs. These come from a 16 pound turkey. Skin side down in a little bit of hot olive oil in your braising pan. This is an enameled cast iron pot, which is so great for braising. We're gonna just put this in here so that the skin gets beautifully brown before we start adding any other ingredients. So to get turkey legs that look that brown takes about five minutes per side. They do look good, don't they? Now, to proceed, we want to take out all but one tablespoon of the fat in this pan. And you can do that by pouring it out or by spooning it out. I'm going to just Spoon out all the excess. Now add a half a cup of dry white wine and deglaze the bottom of the pan. Deglazing scrapes up all those brown bits and tasty little morsels in the bottom of the pan. Perfect. Now add two leeks cut crosswise into quarter inch pieces. Leeks are so flavorful and when cooked, impart a very luscious flavor to your meat. So cook these until they just start to get a little translucent. The best cuts of meat, by the way, for braising and stewing come from harder working muscle groups like legs, shoulders, breasts, uh, neck areas of the animal. And these have more collagen, which helps keep the meat nice and tender. Okay, so now we can add our celery, two ribs cut into quarter inch dice and two carrots, again, cut into dice. So this is like a mirepoix, the Italian sofrito, a flavorful addition to any braised meats. And you can now add chicken stock. This is three cups of chicken stock. And if you have turkey stock, because these are turkey legs, you could use a turkey stock. You can add bay leaves, at least three or four, uh, three or four sprigs of fresh thyme, and some nice plump sage leaves. All of this really does enhance, again, the flavor of what we are braising, turkey legs. Bring that to a boil and reinsert your turkey legs. Start off by braising these skin side down. Have your oven preheated to 300 degrees. After 40 minutes, we're going to turn them over and cook them for another 40 or 45 minutes. And so this is it. The hard work is done. So here are our gargantuan turkey legs. They really do look great. Now, if you're going to splurge and have one per person, serve right onto the plate. Can you eat that? And what I like to do is serve with some delicious, rich, golden Yukon potato puree, mashed potatoes, like that. Some of the lovely gravy, which is the braising liquid. And a little sprinkling of parsley. If you want a little thyme, that's nice too but I like 
to serve with a little fluffy bunch of microgreens. Kind of an odd addition to a giant turkey leg. Anyway, that looks really great. And no need to make a gravy since there's a sauce built right in. Enjoy. And now I have in front of me a turkey breast. You can create a really delicious turkey dinner in no time at all by roasting a rolled turkey breast that's flavored with a delicious compound butter flavored with orange zest, sage, and parsley. This is a fresh turkey breast. It is a lovely piece of meat. I want to turn this over because I want to butterfly it. Breast has a lot of gorgeous meat and I'm going to flatten out the thick parts by just slicing like that and like this. Don't cut through the skin. Don't cut through the uh, flesh. Now turn it over again and loosen the skin with your fingertips. By loosening under the skin, you create a cavity in which you can put your flavored butter. Be prepared while you're working with raw poultry like this or any raw meat, just keep rinsing your hands after you deal with this. So there, okay, so that's loose. And now for the compound butter. Six tablespoons of softened butter, unsalted with a zester like this. Just take off the skin of a nice, big, bright-skinned orange. It's very flavorful. Zest adds such a nice flavor to the turkey meat. And always zest before you cut the orange and juice it. It's very hard to zest a squeezed orange skin. There. You're going to need the juice of the orange, too, so uh, you can Juice the orange at this point if you like. You can just squeeze the juice. You can use a reamer for this. You can just reserve this for later when you're making the gravy. And into the butter and orange zest, put some salt and pepper and some chopped parsley and chopped sage. This is so good. So here we have our compound butter. And take half of this and insert it under the turkey breast. You just put a quarter of it under this side, a quarter under this side. And then you can kind of flatten it out through the skin. So now turn this over. Flatten it out as much as you can. I would put a little bit of salt on the meat, not too much, and a little bit of the pepper and the rest of the butter. Slather it all over the meat. And if the butter is at room temperature, it's so easy to spread it, so easy to deal with it. Now the rolling. Roll the short end up. And we try to get a roll that's of even thickness. And now to tie. Start on one end, and then you can put this around your hand, like this, and pull tight. What you're trying to do is hold it in place, make it of a uniform circumference. It's the same stitch that an embroiderer uses when you finish off the edge of a blanket. That's why it's called the blanket stitch. So there, that looks extremely neat. And take this string underneath and tie right here to finish it off. And there, that looks great. So now this goes into an oven-proof pan. A skillet like this works very, very well. And have your oven preheated to 400 degrees. So big, thick slices, quarter-inch thick slices of onion as the base for the pan. This adds flavor and uh, also some nice vegetables to eat. Carrots, you can just put these around. You're making kind of a vegetable-lined grill pan for your lovely turkey breast. And uh, put the breast right on top. And now add one cup of chicken stock. If you have 
turkey stock in the freezer, use that. And season the skin with a sprinkling of salt and pepper. Right into your oven. Baste every 15 minutes until the interior reaches 150 degrees, about an hour and 30 minutes. So here is our roasted turkey breast. Take off all of the trussing string. So I'm gonna let it just sit here until I defat the gravy. All of these vegetables, remove them from the liquid in the pan. So now, put this into a gravy separator. This is a fat separator. There's a little strainer on the top of this particular one, which I like very much. And you just pour all this juice into here. And you can see the fat is rising to the top of the meat liquid. So into a warm skillet, you can add that orange juice. Remember, if there's any little bits, the orange juice will loosen them. But this is a pretty clean pan. And now your lovely juice from the turkey itself. Add that to your pan and see how the fat is staying in the separator. Oh, this is such a great thing. Just to stop, that's all the fat. Bring this to a boil, have a whisk candy, and then you will add your flour mixture. One and a half teaspoons of instant flour and one and a quarter cups of chicken stock. This is a very good method for a lumpless gravy. So while this cooks, it's gonna take about eight minutes to thicken, you can slice the meat. And I suggest cutting it for a dinner party I think a quarter of an inch thick, like these slices, would be pretty and very tasty. And so here is our gravy. Just pour it into a serving bowl or gravy boat if you have one. And don't forget, if you're going to serve this at a dinner party, a nice icy cold Sauvignon Blanc would be very delightful. Enjoy. If you think your mashed potato recipe needs an upgrade, this silky and creamy potato puree is just the thing. Potato purees may sound simple, but there are a few tricks to achieving a rich, velvety, smooth texture. And today I'll be pureeing russet potatoes from Idaho with brown butter and cream. And the result, well, it is smooth and glorious. So peel your russet potatoes. We need three pounds of potato. And the reason we're using this kind of potato is because uh, they're dry when they cook. And you want a dry, uh, not waxy kind of potato for the smoothest, silkiest purees. And this should just be cut into pieces of a uniform size. So basically in half and half again, and then in pieces. Have a large kettle fitted with a steamer basket and water in the bottom. You can see what I'm talking about here. I love these steamer baskets. They are so, so useful uh, in the kitchen. Very essential for all kinds of vegetable cookery and potatoes, well, they steam very well. Now, if you were adverse to peeling your potatoes, you can steam whole potatoes, three pounds, right in here. They'll take a little longer. Uh, but they work very, very well. So now cover and let steam until very tender to the point of a sharp knife. Now the next step is to make your brown butter. One and a half sticks of butter over a low flame until the milk solids in the butter turn a nutty brown. It takes a little while, but this will impart a really amazing flavor to your potato puree. And in a strainer fitted with a little piece of cheesecloth, add two cloves of garlic and about six sprigs of thyme. Your brown butter is gonna be passed right through this and the butter then will taste a little bit like garlic, a little bit like thyme and a lot like brown butter. So here is our brown butter. It is a really nice nutty brown color. Pour this butter over the garlic Hear the crackling? 
and over the time. And add your one and a half cups of heavy cream. All of this into a saucepan. Now heat this up because this is the liquid with which your potato puree will be thinned and smoothed. Press out all the goodness. The infusion of the garlic and thyme in the butter and cream seems like such a little thing, but it really makes a difference. So I'll leave this on low while I smooth the potatoes. So the potatoes are done. Take the entire steamer basket out and just let them sit for a minute or two just to cool off slightly. You don't want them cold for the next step because we're going to just gently mash them, breaking them up a little bit so that we can then push them through a strainer. Now, you can use a food mill, which acts sort of like a ricer. A ricer, you put the potatoes in and the potatoes come out in little pieces all the way around. Or you could use a tammy, which is a classic French tool that you use uh, to smooth out any kinds of purees. And this is a little too fine for what we're doing, but these chinois come in different textures also, and you could probably use that if you have one. But I find that pretty much everybody has strainers of different gauge screen. This is about a 32nd of an inch screen, and this goes down to much smaller than that, maybe a 64th of an inch screen. Very fine. This is our last pass through. So start with your potatoes. Just put them in a bowl. And now the russets, I am just mashing. And to make all of this go through the strainer quickly, you can add about a cup of your milk and cream mixture. Now that's not traditional. And French chefs out there, don't get mad at me but we find that it just works faster. And I think we don't want to make it hard on our home cooks. These are lessons for the home cook. So I will add, oh, a scoop, maybe a scoop and a half. Now this is the old fashioned potato masher. Sundays before the chicken or the pot roast or the roast beef came out of the oven. This was my job to make the smoothest, most delicious mashed potatoes ever with this. I wasn't happy with the result. It was always a little bit lumpy. That's why we've elaborated on a technique and we're going to put this now through the strainer. Now, very, very important. Don't think that you can use a food processor or a blender they are way too vigorous and will make glue out of your potatoes. They cause too much starch to release and a gluey texture results. But look what's coming out, a very fine textured puree. This now goes right into the finer strainer. So you see, this is the last of the potato to come through the sieve. And it is really good. Now it's time to mix the potatoes with the brown butter, garlic, thyme, cream, and milk mixture. A ladle at a time. It takes a little while for the potatoes to absorb this cream. It seems like a lot of liquid, but these purees are delicate and they are moist and you don't want them to be stiff and dry in any way. I'm going to add some salt right now, coarse salt. This is going to take about a teaspoon of salt and a big pinch of white pepper. Now, if you wish, you could add a hint of nutmeg. There you have it. Put this on a heated platter. Mm, so good. The brown butter sauce makes these potatoes hard to resist. Don't even try.
Now we've made some pretty elaborate roasts, the crown roast of pork, the standing rib roast, expensive cuts of meat, which of course make a big, beautiful impact when served. Uh, but here's a simpler roast um, and one that's good for a big crowd if you want to make several of them or for just a small group. Instead of stuffing and roasting a whole turkey, you can stuff just the breast to create an equally delicious and elegant dish that cooks in less time. And in this recipe, we use a technique called ballotine, in which uh, the turkey breast is boned, the skin is removed carefully, and I'm doing that right now by going underneath the membrane that holds the skin to the meat of the breast. And this is a half of a breast of a, a nice, like, looks like around a 12 or 14 pound turkey. It's a nice piece of meat. And if you need to use the point of a sharp knife to help release it, uh, do so. We don't want to get any holes in the skin. And we want to take it off carefully, leaving it in one whole piece. Because this is what we're going to wrap the stuffed turkey breast in. And the skin, this is the whole skin, and it does stretch, so that's what we reserve. We reserve that. Now turn the turkey breast over, and now we have to butterfly it. Uh, we want to get it into a shape where we can flatten it, stuff it, roll it, and then wrap it. Get all that? Okay, so um, the turkey breast has some natural lines of demarcation here. And with the point of a sharp boning knife, what we want to do is get it as flat as possible, all the same thickness. Now again, if you have a good butcher, ask him to do this for you, but you can do all of this yourself. It's not difficult. So already I'm getting it much flatter. Uh, this white tendon here, you definitely want to take that out. It will be a little bit tough. And you can, again, take this piece of meat and fold it back with a cut. And I think a little bit here too. So now put this in between some plastic wrap. It's like unfolding a book, really. Take a nice long piece, place your meat. On it, leaving a little bit of space at the end, and fold this over, leaving some space like that. So we can spread out the meat and pound away. Now this pounding actually spreads the meat, breaks down the fibers, and um, gives you a uniform thickness, which will enable you to stuff and roll. Okay. So there, that looks pretty good, and I think I will be able to roll that uh, sufficiently well. Try to make as much of a rectangle as you possibly can, because we're gonna roll it this way. Okay, and here's our stuffing. This is. Uh, two cups of sausage and sour cherry stuffing with some onions, some bread squares, parsley, a f just a savory, delicious stuffing. Spread that out on the meat, leaving a little bit of the meat clear at that end. Very nice. Uh, sprinkled with a little bit of salt, especially on the meat itself and some pepper. And then you are going to roll tightly, starting with the short end. Some of the stuffing might fall out, just put it back in. Okay, like that. And now the turkey skin is going to go over the crease, the end, right here. And that will hold everything together with some string. So you want to cover the seam with the skin. 
I don't know, that looks very good. So once you get the skin covering the seam, uh, roll the turkey in a double piece of cotton cheesecloth. Make sure that it is cotton. The cheesecloth will help keep its shape. This looks really, really good. And then we're going to tie it up. And now to make it very even like a fran fancy ballotine, uh, you will tie along the plump little package. This is such a great way to eat turkey and not deal with the entire bird. Now, since the ballotine is quite dense, by covering it in the turkey skin and the buttered cheesecloth, you reduce the risk of drying out uh, the outer layers before the roll is cooked inside. And so now, use six tablespoons of butter that's room temperature, nice and soft, and rub all over the cheesecloth. Nice thick layer. But with the butter, this is going to be delicious. Let me put this right on the baking sheet. Now put this right into a preheated 400 degree oven and roast until the internal temperature registers 155 degrees. Uh, and that takes about 70 to 80 minutes. So now the turkey breast has rested out of the oven for 10 minutes. I am removing the trussing strings, which are coming off very easily here. Now unroll the cheesecloth and look what's inside. A gorgeous golden brown turkey breast. Mm, that, and it's juicy, I can just, I can smell it, I can see it. Really, really beautifully juicy. And look how pretty, very beautiful. Now, if you want to eat this warm, uh, just slice it into, I would say, probably like three quarter inch slices. If you want to serve it cold as part of a buffet, uh, you could do so uh, sliced, I think, a little bit thinner. Impressive, delicious, utterly gorgeous, healthy, and tasty. And out of one half of a turkey breast, you get this very, very beautiful dinner. So now this can be served just like that or with a very pretty garnish of fresh herbs, mm, like this fresh oregano. It smells so good. You can just put a little bit down the plate, just the tips. This would be very nice on a buffet. Now we're going to spatchcock a chicken. This funny word, spatchcocking, is believed to be an abbreviation of dispatch the cock, which was shorthand for prepare the chicken for roasting over a spit. I just find it very amusing and everyone loves to think of what does spatchcocking mean and what does it do? Well, I'm gonna show you. I have two ways to spatchcock when you keep the breast in the center by taking out the backbone and this is very easy to do if you have a good pair of kitchen shears. Just cut along the side of the backbone. It takes a little bit of elbow grease and you remove the entire backbone. This backbone will go right into the stock pot so don't feel bad, you're not wasting it. There. Well, we'll put it here now and that'll go into the stock pot. And then you will flatten the chicken like this and press down on the breastbone and that is a spatched cock bird. And so it's all pretty even. You can trim the skin if you like, but I love skin so much that I leave all the skin on. And that is one version of a spatched cock chicken. And then there is the other way, which some restaurants prefer to do, which is cutting down the breast cutting this right in half along the breastbone and through the wishbone. And it makes a very different looking object. 
Now you can take this breastbone out. I don't know if you've seen the breastbone, but this is what it looks like. This is a piece of grizzly bone that holds that part of the breast out. That's the breastbone. And so now you can flatten this, and it looks like that. And you can tuck the wings under. And this, too, cooks very nicely. So you can choose. You can do both if you're doing more than one chicken. So we're going to make a nice marinade by putting one medium onion into a blender jar with one half cup of parsley, two teaspoons of thyme, two tablespoons of sage, the skin from half of a lemon, two cloves of garlic, and a quarter of a cup of olive oil. Make sure you get all that olive oil out. And just blend this until it makes a nice thick paste. It's a nice green color. Mmm, gorgeous. It smells so good. There. So now this is going to go first under the breast of the chicken. And you can put the chicken right in a resealable plastic bag. This chicken is going to stay in here for eight hours or overnight. It just really makes the meat extremely flavorful. Loosen the skin from the breast and use your rubber spatula to insert this right under the skin. And then the rest of the marinade can just go right into the bag, front and back. Seal up the bag, put this on a tray, and refrigerate. So this is the fun part, wrapping the bricks. This chicken, this spatchcock chicken, is cooked under bricks. And you don't want to put just a raw brick on top of your chicken. So wrap it in aluminum foil. Roll it in a piece of heavy-duty aluminum, sealing the brick in completely. And then oil the brick a little bit before you lay it on top of your bird. So for a chicken this size, you really do need two bricks. And these are reusable. You can use them over and over again. Just change the foil. The chicken itself, well, it's been wiped clean of the excess marinade. And rub a little bit of oil on it. You need to to prevent it from sticking on the grill. We're using a grill pan that sits right on top of the stove. And a tiny bit of olive oil on the grill pan, too. You can do this in the oven. You can do this on a grill outside. Now just pick up your chicken, put it skin side down, and apply your bricks. The bricks really are to hold it flat and promote even cooking. Now if you don't have bricks, and many of us don't, you can use a large skillet, oil the bottom, and you can weight it down with pans and other heavy things. So it's been 30 minutes on the skin side. Just remove the bricks and turn the chicken over if it releases easily from the grill. And this one is releasing very nicely. So whichever way you feel comfortable turning it with a pair of tongs and a fork, such as this, doesn't that look amazing? So great. Oh, I love it. And now put the bricks back on. And finish cooking. It might take another 20 to 30 minutes. But test with your instant read thermometer to 165 degrees. If you don't have one of these wonderful stovetop grill pans, you should really get one. They really work well. Great for hamburgers, too, because all the fat melts off and goes down in those little gullies. So we're going to continue to cook this for another 20 to 30 minutes. Now, once your chicken is perfectly cooked, just let it cool for about 10 minutes. Not really cool, but rest. This will let the juices redistribute. 
You can carve it on the board or you can put it on a platter like this. Garnish it with a few halves of lemon, a little flaky salt on top, a little squeeze of lemon juice overall. And you have a very simple technique which will give you perfectly cooked chicken each and every time. It is a new old way to cook chicken. Vegetables also can be braised. And while almost any vegetable can be cooked in this manner, uh, some of my favorites include leeks, fennel, broccoli rabe, and cabbage. Uh, today I'm going to share my recipe for braised red cabbage and caramelized apples. It's a very delicious recipe, and the process really is the same process that you would use pretty much for any of the vegetables I just mentioned. Now the first thing we do for the cabbage braise is to melt some butter, six tablespoons, in a large deep skillet. Melt a half a cup of sugar in the butter, a whole half a cup. and one and a quarter teaspoons of salt. The apples and the onions are going to caramelize in this mixture. And sugar is needed to caramelize the apples and the onions and balance the tart flavor of the vinegar that's added towards the end. Vegetables that are going to be braised should be cut in rather large pieces. They will hold together nicer that way. And we have two apples cut in wedges, peeled, cored, and I hope you all have an apple corer like this. It really allows you to get nice pieces of apple. Make sure there's no peel left. You don't want to have any of that green peel. And cut the apple into six equal pieces. The onion, too, has to be cut into big wedges. Cut this into eight equal pieces. There. So now sugar is melting well in the butter. So now once all that sugar is melted into the butter, place the onions and the apples in a single layer. It'll pretty much crowd the pan and you will cook, caramelizing everything for about 10 minutes. So beautiful. So braising really cooks everything until it's soft and tender, but everything is still recognizable, which is important. After a few minutes, they're gonna start getting a little bit of color, so watch carefully and you can turn them over. Now the cabbage. Nice little head, I've removed the outer leaves, the tough outer leaves and cut off the stem end and cut the cabbage into eight pieces. And there's a very hard core in the cabbage. We want the cabbage to hold together, so just take out a little bit of that center core. Just enough to make it a little bit more tender, but not enough to make it fall apart. So you can see the apples have taken on a little brown color, as have the onions. Now time to add the cabbage. Just lay the cabbage right on top. These nice wedges of red cabbage leaves. And we add water and also vinegar. Adding an acid like vinegar helps to develop the complex flavors in the dish. And the acid also in the vinegar helps to keep the cabbage a bright purple color. So three quarters of a cup of water and the same amount of cider vinegar. I like cider vinegar. It goes very, very nicely with cabbage, with apples, with onions. Bring that to a boil, cover, and then simmer until the cabbage is tender. That takes about 25 to 30 minutes. It looks really great. You can just pour it out onto a platter. The apples have totally disintegrated, which is great. It sort of makes like an applesauce base. The onions are still visible. This is a great dish to serve with 
roast loin of pork with roast turkey or chicken. 